Hello, this is the third part and the final part of the review on Unit 4 in the A2 Chemistry and Excel. We're talking about organic chemistry and we're going to be talking about spectroscopy. So, the first thing we need to know in organic chemistry was isomerism and chirality. We said chirality is due to having optical isomers, and an optical isomer is one that contains a chiral center. And a chiral center is a carbon that has four different groups attached to it, so that its mirror image is not superimposable on it. So if we have a carbon with four different groups, then we can have optical isomers and the mirror images will not be superimposable on each other. Remember that the two forms of the optical isomers are called enantiomers. So enantiomers are a pair of chiral isomers that are not superimposable mirror images of each. Optical activity is the ability of an optical isomer to rotate the plane of polarized light. So if we have enantiomers, the two mirror images that are not superimposable on each other, each of them alone will rotate the plane of polarized light in opposite directions. But if we have a mixture, equal mixture of both enantiomers, then that is called a racemic mixture and there will be no net uh, rotation of the plane of polarized light. So a racemic mixture contains equal amounts of both enantiomers of a chiral molecule, so there is no net effect on polarized light. If you have a question like this, which of these molecules can rotate the plane of polarized light? Of course, in order to rotate the plane of plane polarized light, it must have a chiral center. That means it must have a carbon connected or bonded to four different groups. So A is this compound. The carbon is not bonded to four different groups. Here, there is no chiral center. Here, there is a chiral center in which the carbon is bonded to four different groups. So this is the one that would rotate the plane of polarized light. Which compound can show both geometric and optical isomerism? I'm going to remind you that geometric is the cis and trans. When we have a double bond in which the carbons of the double bond are bonded to two different groups, then we can have cis and trans, these are geometric isomers. Optical isomers is when we have a chiral center. So, does A have both? Well, it has a chiral center, but the double bond has the carbon on the left bonded to two methyl groups, so this will not show a cis and a trans. Now, B has what? It has a chiral center, and it does have both carbons of the double bond, each of them is bonded to two different groups. So this is the one that will show both geometric and optical isomerism. This, these will show um, none of them. There is no uh, chiral center and the double bonds will not form cis and trans. The compound bromochloroiodomethane has a chiral carbon atom and exists as a pair of enantiomers. The enantiomers will have different what? Now, if I have the two forms of the molecule, the two mirror images, they will have different what? They will have the same boiling temperatures. They will do the same chemical reactions. They will actually have the same color, but they will have opposite effects on the plane of polarized light. They will rotate the plane polarized light in opposite directions. Which of the carbon atoms is chiral? Well, chiral here means it has to be bonded to four different groups. This is the one in C. This compound has one chiral carbon. Draw a circle around the chiral carbon. Where is the chiral carbon in this compound? Chiral carbon is one that is bonded to four different groups. That carbon is the chiral. 
Then we want to talk about aldehydes and ketones. You should realize that aldehydes are the ones that have acetyl bond OH. So we have methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol. Ketones are the ones that have acetyl bond O in the middle of the chain. So that is propanone, butanone, pentanone. This is 2-pentanone and this is 3-pentanone. So these are carbonyl compounds. Aldehydes and ketones have higher boiling points than the corresponding alkanes, of course, because the aldehydes or ketones have permanent dipole-dipole interactions between their molecules, while the alkanes will have only the very weak uh, London dispersion or van der Waals form. Aldehydes and ketones do not form intermolecular hydrogen bonds. That means the aldehyde cannot do hydrogen bond with itself, with other molecules like itself, and the ketone cannot do hydrogen bonds between its molecules. So their boiling point would be lower than the corresponding alcohols because the alcohols can form hydrogen bonding between the molecules. Now, Aldehydes and ketones can, however, dissolve in water because they have a polar carbonyl uh, C double bond O, and this can form hydrogen bonding with water. So they are miscible or they can dissolve in water. Ethanol and, prop and propane have the same molar mass, but ethanol has a much higher boiling temperature. Ethanol is fully miscible in water, but propane is almost insoluble, which intermolecular forces of ethanol are mainly responsible for the higher boiling temperature and the greater solubility in water. Remember, ethanol has uh, permanent dipole-dipole interactions as compared to an alkene, so it's High, uh, boiling temperatures would be higher. So this is due to the permanent dipoles. While the solubility of ethanol in water is due to the formation of hydrogen bonds. Propanone has a much higher boiling temperature than butane. The main reason for this is, of course, we said propanone is a ketone. So the higher uh, boiling temperature is due to the permanent dipole-dipole interactions with, between its molecules, while butane only has the weak van der Waals forces. How do we test for aldehydes and ketones? Both aldehydes and ketones, we react with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine to give an orange-yellow precipitate. Now, what is 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine? This is the molecule and we can represent it by R, NH, NH2. Now, when it reacts with an aldehyde or a ketone, it forms this kind of product, and that means the precipitate that is formed is unique for each type of aldehyde and ketone that reacted with the 2 4 dinitrophenone hydrazine, and that is why this reaction, first of all, it's used to test for aldehydes and ketones as a as opposed to any of the other molecules, and it can be used to identify which aldehyde and which ketone we're talking about from the melting point of the precipitate that we get. So the precipitate that is obtained with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, I can filter, uh, wash, dry, recrystallize, get the melting point, and then compare it with data book values. I can determine which aldehyde or ketone it was made from. Now, to distinguish between aldehydes and ketones, you should know that only aldehydes react with Tollens reagent to give a silver mirror, and only aldehydes react with Benedict solution or Fehling to give a brick red precipitate. Now, please realize that the brick red precipitate is due to the copper one oxide. So this cannot be used to identify the compound. It doesn't make a difference which aldehyde we're talking about. The precipitate we get has nothing to do with the aldehyde. So if we say an unknown aldehyde may be identified by measuring the melting temperature 
of the purified precipitate formed in which reaction? We said which precipitate can we use to identify the aldehyde? It is the precipitate from 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine. When ethanol is warmed with either Fehling's or Benedict's, a red precipitate is formed. What are the red precipitate and the organic product? You should realize that the red precipitate is due to copper 1 oxide, while the organic product is the sodium ethanoate if we're reacting it with ethanol. So, how do we obtain aldehydes or ketones? We can do that from oxidation of alcohols. So, if alcohol is boiled with oxidizing agent like potassium dichromate or potassium permanganate, acidified, the primary gives an aldehyde and then an acid, while the secondary alcohol would give a ketone. Or we could do it by reduction of acids. If we put lithium aluminium hydride in dry ether, we can reduce the acid to aldehyde. Of course, if we continue to reduce it, it would then go on to do an alcohol. So we can just stop it in the middle, distill it off as it is being formed, then we get the aldehyde. So ethanol may be prepared by which of these? We said I can distill from a mixture of ethanol and uh, acidified potassium dichromate. This ethanol is a primary alcohol. Oxidation and distilling of the product will give the aldehyde. Now, what are reactions of aldehydes? First of all, I can return them back to alcohol. Reduction using what? Lithium aluminium hydride in dry ether. Remember, these are the conditions for reducing an aldehyde or a ketone to an alcohol. Or we can add hydrogen cyanide. So when we add cyanide in presence of acid, this forms what we call a cyanohydrin, and then a hydrolysis with dilute acid changes the CN into an acid. This acid with an OH on it, if we um, heat it with concentrated acid like sulfuric acid, then it will remove water and it could be used to form an alkene from this compound. Now, mechanism of addition of cyanide. Remember that cyanide here is acting as a nucleophile, so this is nucleophilic addition. And we said the carbon will have a slightly positive, the oxygen will have a slightly negative, and this will uh, form the cyanide added to the carbon and then the O- minus will uh, pick up an H plus or attack an H plus to form the alcohol. Another reaction of methyl ketones, if I have this kind of product of compound with a CH3C double bond O, and please remember this could be a ketone or an aldehyde. So the R here, if it is an H, then we're talking about an aldehyde. So the important thing is we have a CH3 next to a C double bond O. We do what we call the iodoform test. This is reaction with iodine in aqueous base, aqueous sodium hydroxide. This gives a yellow precipitate and a substance with an antiseptic smell. This confirms the presence of the CH3C double bond O, and please remember that the yellow precipitate is due to the formation of CHI3. So the product CHI3, this is the one that is forming a yellow precipitate. So if we have a carbonyl compo compound with molecular formula C5H10O, reacted with iodine in alkaline solution to give a pale yellow precipitate with antiseptic smell. Of course, this means that we should be looking for a compound that has CH3, C double bond O. So this is the compound that has CH3, C double bond O. When propanone reacts with iodine in presence of sodium hydroxide, the precipitate formed has which formula we said the yellow precipitate is due to the CHI3. 
and please distinguish A and B. A is CH3I, that's not the one we want. We want the one with three iodines. Compare and contrast the reactions of propanal and propanone with one oxidizing agent, one reducing agent, and 2,4-dinitrophenyl hydrazine. In your answer, include any relevant observations, uh, equations for any reactions, uh, classified as oxidation using uh, this sign for oxygen and so on. So what, what are we trying to do? We have propanal and propanone. So both propanal and propanone react with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine to give an orange precipitate. And both react with, the, we want to reducing agents. So that's lithium aluminum hydride in dry ether to give the alcohol. Propanal forms propane 1 all, a primary alcohol, while propanone forms propane 2 all, a secondary alcohol. Now, only propanal reacts with what? Propanal reacts with acidified potassium dichromate. Remember that the ketone propanone cannot be further oxidized. So propanal reacts with acidified potassium dichromate to give propanoic acid. And the color of the potassium dichromate, you have to remember, changes from orange to green, while propanone cannot be oxidized. And this is the equation for the oxidation of propanal. Okay, carboxylic acids and acyl compounds. Carboxylic acids, of course, have this group, C double bond OOH. So this is methanoic acid, ethanoic acid, propanoic acid. And you should know how to write the skeletal formula of an acid. So this is pentanoic acid. Now what is this? This is 2-methyl butanoic acid. This is 3-methyl butanoic acid. And this is propanoic acid. So these are examples of the skeletal formula of uh, carboxylic acids. Now, physical properties, you should realize that an acid has higher boiling point than the corresponding alkane, aldehyde, and ketone. So if we have alkane, aldehyde, ketone, and acids that have the same number of carbons, then the acid will have higher boiling point because the molecules can do hydrogen bonding with each other. And this requires a larger amount of energy to be broken. Remember that if we talk about the intermolecular forces, the uh, acids have permanent dipoles and hydrogen bonding in addition to the weak van der Waals forces, while alkanes have only weak van der Waals forces, Aldehydes and ketones have only permanent dipole-dipole interactions in addition to van der Waals forces. Now, hydrogen bonds with water allows the acids to be miscible with water, so carboxylic acids can dissolve in water. Which of the following show the correct order of increasing boiling temperatures? If I have, my choices are ethanol, ethanol and ethanoic acid so they all have the same number of carbons but of course the acid would have the highest and the aldehyde would have the lowest since ethanol can form hydrogen bonding also between the molecules okay acids react with lithium aluminum hydride in dry ether if the product is immediately distilled off, we get an aldehyde. If we leave it in the lithium aluminum hydride with a dry ether, we eventually uh, reduce it to form alcohol. So if we see this compound, the molecule shown below was reacted with excess lithium aluminum hydride, that's the same thing, in dry ether followed by addition of acid, what would be reduced? So we're adding lithium aluminum hydride to something that has aldehyde on the left, that will be reduced to alcohol. Acids on the right, that will be reduced to alcohol. But the lithium aluminum hydride does not uh, react with a double bond, so I will end up with the double bond still there. Reactions of acids, they react with base to form salt plus water. They react with carbonates to give salt plus carbon dioxide plus water. 
which tests would result in effervescence with this compound. Of course, this is an acid. So, acid plus what will form effervescence? It is with carbonate because it gives carbon dioxide gas. Alcohol plus acid form ester. And you should know this. And when I have acid reacting with alcohol, we remove the OH of the acid, H of the alcohol and join. And the name of the ester would be, will start with the name of the alcohol. So I'm starting with ethanol. So this is ethyl something. And I'm starting with ethanoic acid. So it is ethyl ethanoate. If I have this, again, acid plus alcohol. Remove the OH from the acid. Remove the H from the alcohol and join. What would be the name? This was made from ethanol, so it is ethyl something. And it was made from propanoic acid, so it is ethyl propanoate. This question concerns four organic compounds. Which two compounds react together to form a new compound? Of course, what we have here is alcohol, aldehyde, ketone, acid, and the two that can react together are the alcohol and the acid to form an ester. Reaction with PCL5. Okay, if we have acids and we said also if we have alcohols with PCL5, we get the acyl chloride plus POCl3 plus HCl, which is seen as white fumes. Please remember that this reaction has to be in anhydrous conditions. We don't want water anywhere because the PCL5 would react with the water instead of reacting with the acid or in addition to reacting with the acid. Propanoyl chloride is formed when propanoic acid reacts with what? So again, when the PCL5 reacts with acid, what comes out is called an acyl chloride. So this is with the reaction of PCL5. Acyl chlorides are the ones in which we have C double bond O and Cl. So the OH of the acid is replaced by the Cl and the names are ethanoyl chloride. So that's an acid chloride. Acid chlorides are more reactive than carboxylic acids. So I, if I want to form esters like the previous reaction, I could use an acyl chloride instead of an acid, it would react faster. This is because the carbonyl carbon uh, has a relatively large partial positive charge because it is bonded to two electronegative elements. So the carbon that in, in there has a positive charge and the oxygen has negative and the chlor chlorine has a partial negative so we said acyl chlorides are reactive. So if we uh, react it with water, it is hydrolyzed to form the acid plus HCl. If we react it with uh, alcohols, it forms an ester. So this is a better reaction than reacting the alcohol with carboxylic acid. If we react it with an amine or ammonia, Remember, amines are derivatives of ammonia. So ammonia is NH3. Amines, you replace the hydrogens with carbons or methyl groups uh, or alkyl groups in general. Then what is formed is an amide. So this is the reaction of ammonia or amines with an acyl chloride to form amides. Uh, remember that if we have, instead of ammonia, we have, for example, methyl amine, then my product is N, methyl ethanamide. Which of the following could not be formed when methyl amine is added to ethanoyl chloride? If I add methyl amine, this is methyl amine, to ethanoyl chloride, this is my product, plus HCl, so I can form HCl, but I cannot form the CH3CONH2. The NH2 is formed if I started with ammonia. Esters are the ones that have C double bond O or something, O carbons. 
So we say OR or alkyl groups. So how do we name them? The part that was alcohol, that was, that will be the uh, alkyl derivative of the esters. So if we have this kind of compound, this is methyl ethanoate. The part that has C double bond O was the acid. And the part that has OC something, that was the alcohol. So how do we name this? The part after the CO something, that was the alcohol. So this is ethyl methanoate. This is ethyl ethanoate. And this is ethyl butanoate. How do we prepare esters? We said either alcohols with acids or alcohols with acyl chlorides to form the esters. Reactions of esters, I can break up an ester, and that is called hydrolysis, using uh, alkaline uh, hydrolysis. This uses sodium hydroxide or using an acid, so we can do acid hydrolysis. If we're doing alkaline hydrolysis, the product is the sodium salt of the acid plus the alcohol. But if we're doing acid hydrolysis, that means we're breaking it up using an acid, then the, uh, what we obtain is the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol. So if we say propyl propanoate can be made from propanoic acid in two steps. Propanoic acid is first changed to propanoyl chloride and then we form propyl propanoate. So how do we change propanoic acid to the acid chloride? We said we react it with phosphorus pentachloride. And please note here the question requests the name of the reagent, so don't write PCL5. We want the name. The name is phosphorus pentachloride or phosphorus 5-chloride. Now, in order to change propanoyl chloride to propyl propanoate, that means I have to react it with propane 1 or A reaction scheme involving butanoic acid is shown. So I'm starting with an alcohol. I'm going to add acidified potassium dichromate and I get butanoic acid. So that alcohol must have been buta butane one all and we can write it by name or by formula. So this is butane one all. Now if I want to change butanoic acid to butanoyl chloride that means I'm adding PCL5. Now, when I have the acid chloride and I react it with, that is methyl amine, what I get is N-methyl, this is called N-methyl ethanamide. How do we form polyesters? Of course, polyesters are polymers in which I react something that has two acids on its end, so that's a diacid with a diol, something that has two OHs. We remove the OH from the acid, H from the alcohol. OH from the acid, H from the alcohol. And that forms the polyester. So this polymer, we have a repeat unit. It could be made from which monomers? Well, we take a look. What, which parts do we have in here? We have a part on the right and a part on the left. Anything that has a C double bond O was originally an acid and anything that has just an O was originally an alcohol. So this is actually uh, an acid with an alcohol. So this is the... Then we need to talk about spectroscopy. So in spectroscopy we had mass spectrometry and in mass spectrometry, we said we have, uh, we look at the mass spectrum, the highest M over E, that is the 72 here for pentane. This is the parent ion peak, and this is the one that will give the uh, molecular mass of the compound. And then the other peaks give the 
uh, different fragments that the compound may break into. So, for example, if we have a question like this, an aliphatic compound Z with five carbon atoms gave an orange precipitate with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine and no reaction with uh, silver ammoniacal silver nitrate, that's tolerance. We said if anything reacts with 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, it could be an, uh, an aldehyde or a ketone. But no reaction with tollens, which is ammoniacal silver nitrate, then it must be a ketone. The M over E we're given is 86, and it has five carbon atoms, and that means this is the formula. Now we're required to draw the three possible structures of Z, so we're trying to draw five carbons. That is a ketone with M over E 86, so these are the three possible structures that we could have. Mass spectrum of ethanoyl chloride would not be expected to have a peak at what? If we have ethanoyl chloride, we can have peaks at 35 and 37 and 43 and 78, but I cannot have a peak at 35.5. For infrared spectroscopy, the molecules absorb IR. These are the ones that change their bond polarities. And we have in the data booklet all of this, so you can refer to it. But in general, you should know that a carboxylic acid would have peaks for C double bond O at around 17 something and for the OH at around 3300. Now, this means both of them present means that we have a carboxylic acid. But if we have only a peak at 3300, around 3300, then this is an alcohol. If I have a peak only at around 17 something, then this is a ketone. Remember, the aldehyde will also have a peak at 17 something, and there will be specific peaks at are before 2800 or around 2800, 2900 for the CH of the C double bond O. An amide would have a peak that is around 3500. This is the peak for NH. And there will be a strong peak for the C double bond O also at around 1700. Then this is an amide. An ester would have the C double bond O peak between 1735 and 1750. So you can use all of these to determine the compound. Now, NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance absorbs radio waves. We have two types of NMR. We have carbon-13 NMR that detects the carbon-13 isotope of carbon. And we have the proton NMR that detects the hydrogen nuclei. Remember that for something to absorb in the, for the nuclear uh, magnetic uh, resonance NMR, the nucleus must have an odd number of nucleons. So a hydrogen nucleus will have only one proton in its nucleus, so it can have a spin. The carbon-12 cannot have a spin because it has 12 nucleons. This is not an odd number. But the carbon-13, that 13 is an odd number, so this nucleus has a spin. So remember that the NMR is due to uh, presence of strong external magnetic field. The nuclei align either with the field or opposed to it and the nuclei that are aligned with the external magnetic field absorb radio waves, remember, and flip to the higher energy level. That's how we get a spectrum. So to obtain an NMR spectrum, the sample is placed in a magnetic field. As the magnetic field is varied, the nuclei in different chemical environments will absorb different amount of energies and flip, and the NMR spectroscopy measures this absorption. So, which type of radiation is used in NMR? Please remember, we said it is radio waves.
The radio waves used in proton NMR can do what or must do what? Remember that the radio waves in the proton NMR cause the hydrogen nucleus to change its spin state. Now, if we have carbon-13, then we're looking at the carbons in the molecule, and the carbons will show peaks if they have different carbon environments. So, for example, if we're talking about pentanone, each of these carbons has different carbon environments, so each of them will give a peak. For hexane, hexane can be regarded as a symmetrical molecule, so I will have only three peaks because uh, three of them are similar to the other three. Chloropentane, we have how many peaks? We have three different peaks, again, because it is symmetric. Remember that all of this uh, NMR is measured in reference to tetramethylsilane. So tetramethylsilane is the reference. It's given a ppm of zero, and then all the others are above it. The chemical shift of a peak indicates the functional group. So the number of the peaks would indicate if there is symmetry within the molecule. So for each peak, the present, the, the position of the peak or the chemical shift of the peak is due to which type of carbon it is bonded to, bonded to what, and so on. The number of the peaks would indicate uh, the different environments. So we have this in the data booklet, the carbon-13 NMR shifts uh, relative to tetramethyl silane. So if we have ethanol, for example, it gives only two peaks in the carbon-13 NMR because we have two different types of carbons or two carbon environments. To distinguish between propanone and propanal, can we use carbon-13? Remember that propanone is symmetrical. The two methyl groups are the same. So we're going to have only two peaks, one for the methyl groups and one for the C double bond O. But in propanal, all three carbons are different, so we're going to have three peaks in the carbon-13 NMR. So if the question says, compound X, give an orange precipitate with Brady's reagent, which is 2 for the nitrophenyl hydrazine, and no reaction with tolerance. First of all, if it gives orange precipitate with 2 for the nitrophenyl hydrazine, that means it could be an aldehyde or a ketone, but if it doesn't react with tolerance, then it is a ketone. When X is added to a solution of sodium hydrogen carbonate, effervescence occurred. That means I have a carboxylic acid. The empirical formula is C4H6O3. The carbon-13 NMR had only four peaks. Did use two possible structures of X. So we want four carbons. And the carbon-13 NMR has four peaks, and that means we have four different carbons. We want a carboxylic acid group and a ketone group, so these are the two possible structures. Carbon-13 spectroscopy provides information about the structures of propanal and propanone. Identify the chemical shift of the carbon environment of one peak you would expect to see in both. So, if I have uh, propanal and propanone, which peak will I see in both? I will see the peak for the C double bond O. Around this, you get that number from the data booklet. State the number of peaks you would expect to see in carbon-13 NMR of propanal. Can you see propanal? All three carbons are different, so it will give three peaks. In propanone, we have a peak for the C double bond O, and then both methyl groups on both sides are equivalent. Proton NMR spectroscopy, again, we have this table in the data booklet. We have what we call low resolution NMR. This gives single peaks. There is nothing uh, of what we call splitting. So the low resolution proton NMR, for example, for ethanol will give three peaks. 
Remember that in each, in the proton NMR, we're looking at the hydrogens. So we have the hydrogens of the methyl group, and we have the hydrogens of the CH2, and we have the hydrogen of the OH. So these are the three peaks that we get. Remember that the heights of the peaks are relative to the number of hydrogens. So the one that is due to three hydrogens is higher than the one that is due to two hydrogens is higher than the one that is due to one hydrogen. And the area indicates the relative number of uh, hydrogens. So if we say ethanoic acid, for example, which kind of protons do we have? We have only two types of protons. We have the proton of the OH of the acid and we have the hydrogens of the CH3. Now, in the high resolution, each peak is split into a number of peaks, and the splitting has to do with how many hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. So the height of the peak itself is due to the number of hydrogens on my carbon that I'm looking at. And then the splitting indicates how many hydrogens on the rel a neighboring uh, carbon and we have something called n plus one so if we have ethanol ethanol we have the ch3 on the left the ch3 i will have a peak due to the three hydrogen so this is the highest peak but then on the next carbon i have two hydrogens so my peak for the CH3 will be split into three. We have N plus one rule. So if I have two hydrogens on the neighboring carbon, then my peak would be uh, split into three. So the um, CH3 protons, the peak is a triplet. Now the CH2 has three hydrogens on the neighboring carbon, so it is split into four. So that's a quartet. Now the peak of the OH does not split. So to interpret any H uh, proton NMR, we use the uh, position to determine what kind of proton. And we use the area under the peak to determine how many hydrogens it is due to. And we use the rule of N plus 1 to determine how many protons on the adjacent core. So if I have this compound, high resolution proton NMR shows four peaks and the splitting in these peaks should be what? Now, if I look, this is the, the compound. I will have four peaks because I have a CH3, CH2, CH2, and CH3. So these are the three types of hydrogens. Now, the CH3, if we start from the right, the CH3 that has a C double bond O next to it, this protons don't have protons on an adjacent carbon. So they will be singlets. So the peak due to the CH3 on the right is a singlet. And then the CH2 next to the C double bond O, it has two hydrogens on its neighboring carbon. So this will be split into a triplet. The um, CH2 next to CH3 in the middle here, this will have three hydrogens on the neighboring carbon and two hydrogens on the previous carbon. So it has five neighboring hydrogens, so it is split into six. And the hydrogens on the CH3 on the left has two hydrogens on the neighboring carbon. So it is split into uh, three, so that's a triplet. So we have one singlet, two triplets, and one split into six. And then we need to talk about chromatography. So let us talk about the different types of chromatography. First of all, we have paper chromatography. This is where the in all of the chromatography, we're going to have something called a mobile phase and a stationary phase. So if we're talking about paper chromatography, the paper is the stationary phase. And the mobile phase is the solvent that will carry the components up the paper. So if we have a sample at the uh, near the bottom of the paper, the mobile phase carries these samples up. And it, which one goes up the more depends on 
does this component have stronger attraction to the stationary phase that is the paper or stronger attraction to the mobile phase which is the solvent that's carrying so a spot that goes up very high means it has stronger attraction to the mobile phase while something that doesn't move up the paper has strong attraction to the stationary phase so this is all due to something called partition partition is a separation of substances due to different solubility in two solvents so the substances are separated due to their different solubilities in the solvent and in the stationary phase so in paper chromatography the greater solubility the faster the rate of movement of the paper so here the blue spot has moved up faster and that means it has more more attraction to the mobile phase or more soluble in the mobile phase we can then calculate what we call the rf value the rf value is the distance moved by the spot divided by the distance moved by the solvent and all of this starts from the baseline which was the line where the spots were placed of course the highest rf value we can get is one uh, something that goes up the mid middle of the paper would have an rf of about 0.5 or slightly more or slightly less if we're working with sugars or amino acids sugars or amino acids don't have a color so there is nothing that I can see when I put spots on the paper and then put the paper in the solvent and so on. But after the chromatogram is removed, I can spray it with a substance which we refer to as locating agent. This is a chemical that will give the spots color to make it more visible. So, if we have a question like this, a spot caused by an amino acid has moved 42 millimeters from the baseline of a paper. So, this is the spot. The RF value is 0 0.62. What is the distance moved by the solvent? We said RF is distance moved by spot over distance moved by solvent. So, what do we have? We have the distance moved by the spot, that is 42. We have the RF, which is 0 0.62. So if we rearrange, we get that the distance moved by the solvent was 68 millimeter. Now, instead of using a paper, I can use a glass slide with a layer of alumina or silica placed on it. So we get a glass slide and we get the alumina and the silica. They do not dissolve in water but I add a little bit of water, this forms a slurry, and I spread it on the glass slide, leave it to dry, so this is what I use as my stationary phase. I put spots of the sample, again put it into a small amount of solvent, and the solvent moves up the paper. Again, the one that moves up higher is the one that has stronger attraction to the mobile phase, or the solvent, while the one that does not move up that high has stronger attraction to the stationary phase, which is the alumina or the silica. It, of course, if we have polar substances, so polar molecules will be absorbed more strongly to the silica, so they will travel up more slowly. So the one that doesn't go up very far is the more polar one, the one that goes up far, that means it dissolves more in the solvent, less attraction to the layer of alumina or silica. This is the less polar molecule. Remember that the word adsorption means the separation of substances due to different attraction between compounds and the stationary phase relative to their solubility in the solvent. So we said if they go up, much higher then there there is less attraction to the stationary phase they're not absorbed onto the stationary phase they are more soluble in the solvent if they don't go up that high that means they are more absorbed to the stationary phase less soluble in the solvent
So if we say a mixture of organic compounds was analyzed using thin layer chromatography, the RF value was 0.92 for one of the components. What can be deduced about the attractions between that component and the stationary and mobile phases? Remember, if the RF is 0 0.92, that means it went up a lot. So the spot was very high. And that means the attraction between the su substance and the stationary phase is weak while its attraction to the mobile phase is strong. And that is why it went up with the solvent. The other kind of chromatography is HPLC or high performance liquid chromatography. In this case, we have the stationary phase is a liquid. Stationary phase is a non-volatile liquid, such as a long chain hydrocarbon on a solid support. Uh, such as small particles of silica and the mobile phase is usually a polar solvent like methanol or water. So the mobile phase is forced under pressure through the densely packed column and a detector records the retention time. The retention time is the time it takes for the component to pass through the column from the point of injection to the detector. So if I'm introducing the substance at the top of this column, then the time it takes to come out from the other end of the column, that is called the retention time. Of course, if we have polar components in uh, the uh, mixture, then they will have greater solubility in the polar solvent, so they will be carried through the column faster than non-polar components. So the ones that came out first so here it is component number one this is a more polar sub substance since my solvent was polar and this went out very quickly with the solvent that means it dissolved in the solvent or it was more attracted to the solvent so this means that component one is more polar while component three that took a longer time to come out is less so if we say two polar compounds are separated using HPLC, the retention times are not affected by what? Now, what would affect the time it takes for the substance to go through the column or what would not affect it? So if we talk about the pressure used, of course, yes, the pressure used would determine the retention time. The particle size of the stationary phase, well, that would affect how fast the substance comes out. The polarity of the stationary phase, yes, we said if the substance is polar, then it will be attached to something that is polar if that is the stationary phase. But the concentration of the compound does not affect the retention time, the concentration, whether I add a small amount of the compound or a large concentration, this would not affect the time it takes to go. In a separation using HPLC, the stationary phase was polar and the mobile phase was non-polar. Which compound would take the most time to travel through the column? Of course, if the mobile phase is non-polar, and stationary is polar. The one that will take the most time to travel through the column is the one that will be absorbed more to the stationary. So I'm looking for the one that is polar. Which of these is polar? Well, if you look at uh, the choices I have, the one chloropentane is the most polar and that means this will be attached more strongly to the stationary phase and take a longer time to come out. The other kind of chromatography is gas chromatography and this is used to identify organic compounds with very low boiling points. It is similar to the HPLC but the sample is a gaseous sample. The column contains the stationary phase and the sample is moved through by an inert carrier gas. So the, in the gas chromatography, 
the mobile phase that is carrying my substance through is an inert carrier gas like hydrogen, helium, or nitrogen. Different components take different times, just like the HPLC, to go through the column and have different retention times. Uh, this can be used to um, identify unknown compounds by comparing the retention times with retention times of known compounds. Remember that the area under the peaks in the chromatogram are proportional to the amount of the compound. The number of the peaks shows the number of components. Of course, percent of a substance would be the peak area of that substance over the total peak areas times 100. So, in this question, in gas chromatography, a gas containing a mixture is passed over a liquid stationary phase. The main reason a mixture is separated into its components is because they have different what? When we are separating substances in the gas chromatography, this is due to forces of attraction to the liquid. And this is also the same in most of the other types of chromatography. In gas chromatography, the time taken for a substance to travel through the column is called the, in any of the chromatographies, HPLC or GC, we said the time taken for a substance to travel through the column is called the retention time. Which of these gases is normally used as a mobile phase in gas chromatography? Remember we said the mobile phase in the gas chromatography is an inert gas, so something like argon. Chromatography is a chemical technique used to analyze mixtures. A component of a mixture will move more quickly through a gas chromatography column if it has lower adsorption to the stationary phase. And that's the end of this quick review of Unit 4. Uh, I hope this was useful and good luck on your exam. Thank you for listening.